Hello and greetings. This is RPG Mods Fan, and in this video, I will be reviewing and discussing the Dungeons and Dragons module A4 in the Dungeons of the Slave Lords, which was written by I'm going to have trouble with this name, Lawrence Schick, Lawrence Schick, and published by TSR in 1981. This module was meant for player characters between the levels of 4 to 7. This module was written for AD&D first edition rules. Also, it was written before there were a lot of ability rolls and checks, which were incorporated into the fifth edition rules. This module was meant to be a thinking person's dungeon not an Abilities Checks dungeon. So, as a dungeon master, I would not outright forbade Ability Checks, but rather make judgment calls on when to allow them and when not to. This adventure takes place in the fantasy world of Greyhawk, within the Orcish Kingdom of Pomage, within the Trackhandsgrab Mountains. For this module, the adventure takes place on the Isle of the Slave Lords, which is located in the middle of a crater lake within the Trackhandsgrab Mountains. As FYI, the mountain on the Isle of the Slave Lords is called Mount Flamenblut. I love these names by TSR. Some modifications are needed by the Dungeon Master if they plan on running this module in the Forgotten Realms. I will suggest three possible locations as I have before my previous videos all of which lie on the eastern side of the Sea of Fallen Stars. Mountains nearby the following suggested locations can be used. Chacenta, Threshkel, or Thay. The plot hook of the A series modules is as follows. Organized bands of pirates and slavers have been raiding the coastal towns on the Sea of Girnaut and taking captives into slavery. The player characters were hired by the lords of these coastal towns to eradicate the slavers. In Dungeon Module A1, Slave Pits of the Undercity, a band of fearless adventurers, which were the player characters if they played through the A1 module, discovered the slavers, which were mostly orcs, to be operating out of a ruined temple within Highport City. In Dungeon Module A2, Secret of the Slavers' Stockade, the slave lords were also operating in an old fort in Drakhandsgrab Hills. The band of adventurers found the fort and disrupted the slavers' operations there. In Dungeon Module A3, Assault on the Area of the Slave Lords, the player characters searched for the rest of the slavers, which led them deep in and under the Drakhandsgrab Mountains. Eventually, to the town of Sunderham, which is located on an island in the middle of a crater lake. I will now be discussing the module itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not 
to watch the rest of this video. The module begins with the player characters, one way or another, being captured by the slave lords from the previous adventure, which is the A3 module Assault on the Area of the Slave Lords. They are stripped of all their belongings, including armor, weapons, spellbooks, magic items, etc., and are imprisoned. The jailers give special treatment to the spellcasters, such as clerics and mages, to ensure that they do not get enough rest to regain their spells. The nearly naked player characters are put to sleep and then lowered into the dungeons of the slave lords. They are meant to be the proverbial sacrifices. Near them, the player characters will find a scroll tube with three magical scrolls in it. There is also a note that reads, This is the best I can do to help. May your gods be with you. If you escape, your equipment is being held on the Slave Lord's private boat, the Water Dragon, at the Sunderham docks. Signed, your friend from the gate. For those who read the previous A3 module or have watched my video of the A3 module, they will know who this friend of the gate is. As a DM or dungeon master, I would be more forgiving to player characters who are actively thinking and coming up with good ideas on their own, such as breaking off stalactites and stalagmites to use as clubs. As a DM, I would allow this despite what the module says. Looking for bones of former victims of the dungeons to use as clubs, or by splintering the bones, using them as sharp objects for cutting purposes. Tearing strips of their loincloth to be fashioned into slings, fashioning stuff from the giant mushrooms in the mushroom chamber. I would even entertain disgusting things, such as fashioning airbags from the intestines of defeated monsters. As a DM, I would not limit what the player characters can do just because it is not covered in the module. By the way, the Isle of the Slave Lords is actually a volcano that is about to erupt. Before the characters were thrown to the dungeons, there was an earthquake. This earthquake has rattled the Slave Lords and prompted them to offer up the player characters as sacrifices. During gameplay, there will be more tremors and earthquakes, each increasing in magnitude. The first one will be 40 minutes after the gameplay starts. The next one will be 35 minutes later. The next one will be 30 minutes later, and so on. To me, what makes the A4 module so memorable is that it has so many story elements. All right, so now I will start discussing the module itself. Not too far from where the player characters start is the layer of a Sandling. The Sandling monster makes its debut in this module. Towards the bottom left-hand side of the map, a very small kobold kingdom can be found. Normally, kobolds will not be a challenge to most any player character. However, when a character is stripped of his or her armor and weapons, 
This is no longer the case. There is not much to say about this group of kobolds. If the player characters do not attempt to parlay with the kobolds, the module describes how the kobolds will defend their home. At the bottom right-hand corner of the map is a chasm. At the other side of the chasm is a giant ant's lair. There is a slim bridge across the center of the chasm, made of dried dead giant ant bodies. This bridge is relatively lightweight and can be carried by two strong members of the party. Otherwise, fighting the ants and trying to find an exit here will be unwise for the player characters to pursue. A damp chamber with a green glow lies not too far from where the player characters start. Clustered in the center of this chamber are a shrieker, a violet fungus, and glow fungi which thinking player characters can use as a light source after defeating both the Shrieker and the Violet Fungus. A large pool of water lies in cavern number 12. Those who stay at the lower side of the cavern will not be attacked by a giant old crayfish who makes its home at the upper side of the cavern. In the cavern tunnel labeled number 14, there is a grumpy beastly badger living on a diet of shellfish that it gets from the aforementioned cavern filled with a large pool of water. Cavern number 15 is filled with strange and colorful molds and fungi, including mushrooms. Some of the mushrooms are nine feet tall with thick log-like trunks. Also in the chamber are three fire beetles. When ingesting a mushroom, there is a 10% chance the mushroom will cause hallucinatory insanity. I believe the back cover of the A4 module depicts such an episode of a player character undergoing an insane hallucination. As far as I can tell, there are no vampires in the A4 module. At the upper left-hand corner of the map is the abode of the myconids. Myconids are also known as fungus men. And myconids are basically walking humanoid toadstools. They are new creatures that were first introduced into the D&D world through this module. At the entrance to the abode of the Myconids are two seven-foot-tall shriekers. They will, of course, start shrieking as soon as they sense any intruders. Within two rounds, the abode's guards will show up to defend the entrance. The Myconids are ruled by a king who is the largest of them and resides in the cavern numbered 16E. It is also here where the king holds council. After defeating the abode's entrance guards, the encounters in the rest of the abode can go one of two ways either peacefully, where the player characters establish diplomatic relationships with the Myconids, or violently. 
almost all the art depicts hostile relationships between the Myconids and the player characters. Chamber number 17 is described as a cavern filled with stalactites and stalagmites. However, one of the stalagmites is actually a half-grown roper. This is one of the more popular encounters of the module. In a dungeon filled with stalactites and stalagmites, how can one not expect to encounter piercers? I have described quite a lot of the dungeon level of this module. Main reason is because there was quite a lot of artwork available to use, which, to me, is the charm of these old yet classic D&D modules. However, I still find the dungeon level to be empty. I would fill it with a little more caverns, stuff, and monsters. For instance, I would add some more weak monsters, such as a carrion crawler. Remember, the player characters were stripped of their armor and weapons, spellbooks, etc. Hence, even weak monsters should now provide a challenge to them. If you were a mean dungeon master, I would add a not fully grown black pudding into the mix. The module describes three escape routes from the dungeons of the slave lords. They are the chimney slash spider cave exit, the water cave exit, and the bat cave exit. The chimney exit is located towards the upper left side of the map. There is a four foot wide natural chimney on the ceiling of the cavern 20 feet above. If the player characters manage to reach the chimney while climbing up and through it, they will encounter a huge creepy spider. At the bottom center of the map is the beginning point of the water cave's exit. Here, a giant crab makes its lair. Within the underwater maze is an exit. To utilize this exit, first, the player characters will need to swim underwater to find it. As you see from the map, there are two underwater tunnels that lead nowhere and are death traps. There is a very deep chasm in front of the entrance to cavern number 21. Cavern number 21 is huge. The ceiling is swarming with bats that can be seen entering and leaving the cavern from the far opposite side of this cavern. 40 feet or 12 meters above the chasm on hidden ledges are three cave fissures. These new monsters and this encounter also makes this module very memorable. This is the map the module provides of the Isles situation once the player characters make it to the surface. As you can see, it is hard to read. Hopefully, this semi-colorized map makes it easier to see what is going on on the island. Upon exiting from the dungeon level, the volcano of the island is now erupting. The player character's next challenge is to escape from the island. The circled L's on the map are where magmen 
are surfacing on top of the lava flows. Magmen are new monsters to the Dungeons and Dragons world, and they were first introduced by this module. If the player characters exited the dungeons from the chimney slash spider escape route, then on the surface they will most likely first encounter a squad of looters from Sunderham. The looters are a motley crew composed of four humans, two goblins, a gnoll, an orc, and a half-orc. If the player characters exited the dungeons from the water tunnels exit, then on the surface they will be on a beach filled with green algae. Green slime lurks amid this green algae. Further along the beach, the player characters will encounter a giant snapping turtle. The module describes this turtle as enraged, yet hiding in the water. Come on now! A volcano is erupting, tremors are shaking the island. As a DM, I would have the turtle thrashing about. Maybe the turtle is desperately trying to reach the water so that it can swim away from the island. That, to me, makes more sense than it hiding in the water. If the player characters exited the dungeons from the Batcave escape route, then on the surface they will most likely first encounter a frenzied and burnt fire lizard. Thinking its natural fire resistance is more than adequate, the fire lizard tried to take a bath in the lava that is flowing over the island. The town of Sunderham is in ruins and burning. Most all of the town is engulfed in poisonous gases. A mob of former slaves are in the process of impaling their former masters, such as overseers and guardsmen. As the party progresses towards the docks, just as Sunderham is burning, likewise the slums in the outskirts are also burning. People from both Sunderham and the slums are crowding the docks and are in panic. Amongst this chaos, the party will meet the agent of the coastal town lords. The same town lords who initially hired the party to eradicate the slave lords. The same agent who initially met the party at the entrance gate of Sunderham in Module A3. The same agent who provided the three magical scrolls to the party at the very beginning of this module. However, he is dressed as a slave lord's lieutenant. So, if your player characters are the shoot first, ask questions later type, then this encounter can go badly. By the way, this agent's name is Salzan Murtano. He, like the player characters, seeks to escape the island and get away as far as possible from the erupting volcano. He suggests to assault the slave lord's ship called the Water Dragon that is still moored at the far end of the docks. Of course, the player characters are free to seek out other means of escape from the island such as crafting a makeshift wooden raft. However, they will face the danger of marine ghouls known as Lacedons that lurks in the waters. Or steal a fishing boat from the poor souls who are overcrowding on it and trying to escape the island. 
Normally, I would be first discussing the villains of a module. However, in the A4 module, it is not the villains who are driving forward the plot, but it is the erupting volcano. The Slave Lord's Galley, the Water Dragon, is moored at the far end of a pier and is being readied for departure. A mob of islanders stand halfway up the pier. Right now they are too frightened to face the slave lords and their minions. However, the situation can easily escalate given the desperate situation everyone is in. To get to the water dragon, everyone will need to fight through 11 of the slave lords minions one of which is an ogre. Presented here is the tactical map of the water dragon. Shown are the positions of where the six remaining slave lords will make their last stand. However, before I will discuss the six remaining slave lords, I will need to take a detour and discuss about the five slave lords that were in the previous module A3, Assault on the Airy of the Slave Lords. What happened to the villains of the A3 module, Airy of the Slave Lords? There were different authors for the A3 and A4 modules and it seems they never communicated with each other. The A4 module presents a set of six new slave lords. The A4 module conveniently writes that the slave lords of the A3 module died due to a combination of the following. 1. Earthquakes 2. Asphyxiation from the volcanic gases released in Sunderham, and three, battling slaves and fellow islanders to get to the water dragon. For player characters, this is very unsatisfying. They all have an axe to grind with the slave lords of the A3 module. They all probably seek vengeance on these particular villains. As a dungeon master, this is what I would do. Have a total of two or three slave lords perish from both modules. Have the party battle a total of six slave lords for the water dragon. The slave lords would be a mix from both the A3 and A4 modules. The remaining slave lords, I would say, escaped on a previous boat, which the player characters can pursue in a future adventure. Okay, now I'm ready to mention the villains of the A4 module. The slave lords are at much higher levels than the player characters. However, due to battling their way to the Water Dragon Galley, their hit points have been reduced and many of their spells have been expended, giving the player characters a fighting chance against them. As with most classic D&D modules from TSR, not much information is provided on the villain's personalities or characters. Stallman Klim is a human 11th level cleric. He is the high priest of the Earth Dragon cult. Lamensten? Lamensten? Really? Okay, from now on I'm calling him Lemonstan. Lemonstan is a human 8th level illusionist. Ed Ralph sounds like a guy's name, not alright. Ed Ralph 
is a Dro, 4th level cleric and 5th level fighter. She is an exile from the underground Dro city of Erelai Sinlu. The decadent Dro city of Erelai Sinlu is detailed in the Dungeons and Dragons module D3 Vault of the Dro. Should the DM wish, here is a chance to tie the A series D&D modules with the D series. For instance, Ed Ralv, I hate that name. For instance, Ed Ralv can be carrying the map of the underworld from the D series. She can also be carrying other documents that help the dungeon master tie his or her campaign to the D series or even its prequel, the G series. Thag Narlot is a half orc, seventh level fighter and assassin. He is, or should I say, was in charge of all espionage activities for the slave lords. Brother Karen is a human six level monk. He is a member of the Scarlet Brotherhood, who are the ones who helped finance and set up the slave lords' operations in the first place. Slippery Keita is a human, 10th level thief. At the stern of the ship is a locked wooden chest. In it are the player character's stolen equipment, drawings by the great drow artist Ul Ertz, which is worth 900 gold pieces, gems, and other valuables. Given that the player characters were not the only ones hired by the lords of the coastal towns, as a bonus, I, as a DM, would add equipment from these adventurers as well. On the screen are suggested treasures to throw in. The A4 module introduces four new monsters for the Dungeons & Dragons game. As described in the module, a Sandling is a silicone-based creature and appears to be an amorphous mass of moving, sliding sand. An adult Sandling is a solidary creature and are savagely territorial. They will attack any creatures that trespass upon their areas. They fight by slashing and lacerating with a coarse, abrasive pseudopods. The Cave Fisher is one of D&D's more popular monsters. As described in the module, Cave Fishers are hard-shelled, many-legged creatures that live by trapping animals with their super strong, highly adhesive filaments, which shoots and extends out of their proboscis. If you are wondering, a proboscis is a long, flexible snout, such as an elephant's trunk, or a slender, tubular sucking organ of certain insects. If the cave fisher makes a successful hit on a prey, it will then be reeled in to be eaten. Myconids are basically walking toadstools and mushrooms. The module gives a lot of details on their characteristics and society. Magmen are dwellers from the para-elemental plane of heat, which lies between the elemental planes of fire and earth. 
And so ends the A series D and D modules, also known as the Slave Lords modules. Or does it? Dun dun dun. Dungeon Magazine number two hundred fifteen contains the adventure titled "The Last Slave Lord." In it, Stamen Klim is supposed to be the villain. In order to plug the pothole of how he survived the events of the A4 module, this adventure states that the player characters fought his clone in the A4 module. If you plan on running this adventure, here is my solution. On the Water Dragon Galley, instead of having Stallman Klim, replace him with Mordramo the 11th level Cleric Slave Lord from the A3 module. Also, this adventure takes place in a monastery. So, I would have this place belong to the Scarlet Brotherhood, who, as I mentioned before, financed and set up the Slave Lord's operations. In addition, I would have Brother Melarjois the human ninth level monk slave lord from the A3 module also be here. In the future, I plan on reviewing other D&D modules, but eventually, at a later date, I do plan on also reviewing this adventure for this channel. For their second edition rules of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, TSR released the Greyhawk adventure titled Slavers. This adventure takes place a decade after the events of the A series modules. It is meant to be played with a brand new set of characters and heroes. Likewise, at a later date, I plan on reviewing this adventure for this channel. The drawings, maps, and art of this module were done by Errol Otis, Jim Rosloff, Steve Sullivan, Jeff D., David C. Sutherland III, Gene Wells, and Bill Willingham. With the exception of four drawings, the rest of the module's art have already been displayed within this review, which I will now present. Credits displayed are the credits found within the module itself. The Dungeons & Dragons A4 module is available for purchase on the Drive-Thru RPG website. The A4 module is also part of the Against the Slave Lords compilation which is also available for purchase on the drive through RPG website. This compilation includes additional fan art, some of which were included in this review. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. I love many types of role-playing games, especially Dungeons & Dragons, Inclusive in my wayward love is computer role-playing games such as Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2, the first two Dragon Age games, Baldur's Gate, and others. In the foreseeable future for this channel, I plan on continuing to review D&D modules in more or less 
alphabetical order of their mod codes. Till next time, this is RPG Mod Spam saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. Control.